Very good. Everyone, want you to stand up? Let's sing together. I am chosen. I am free. I am living for eternity. Free now, forever. You pick me up, turn me around. You send my feet back on the ground. Nothing's gonna hold me back Nothing's gonna hold me back Nothing's gonna hold me back Oh, my chains My chains fell off My heart was free I'm alive to live for you I'm alive to live for you Oh, amazing love How can it be? Sin and shame away. This lady is clean, a brand new day. Free now forever. The only I approach your throne to claim this crown. You claim my own. Oh, you're yours now forever. And nothing's gonna hold me.
darkness Out of the shadow I was living in And I'm so happy I found you You make everything bright I know your goodness I know your mercy will never end Your love is lifting me higher Your love is lifting me higher Your love is lifting me higher again Whenever I feel down hearted Or think I've lost my way Your love reminds me all alone Lord we will never be parted You will never walk away I know your goodness I know your mercy will lead me home I am your Your love is lifting me higher Your love is lifting me higher Your love is lifting me higher
just the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you You're holy There is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes pray together. And Lord, this uh, song that we just sung expresses the desire of our heart. Lord, it's, it's to, uh, to build our lives on you, God. And we just recognize as we look around this world, Lord, is that there just seems to be so much instability and turbulence, God. And then we look into our hearts and often our hearts, God, are so uncertain and, and afraid. And, and so, Lord, you come and God, you invite us 
uh, to build our lives upon the firm foundation of your life, Lord. And so as best as we know how, as we begin our time, is that we want to, to tell you that we'll place our trust in you, Lord, that we trust you, that we'll place our faith and our hope and confidence in you. And Lord, we're uh, trusting that as we do, that you're gonna be building, God, something solid out of our lives. God, you're gonna fill our lives with meaning and purpose and mission and love. And so, Lord, we just want to believe that, uh, that this time will be one of those times, God, where we can receive that receive from you, Lord, and so that our lives, God, will just pour out with your goodness to the world around us, God. So we just uh, look to you for that work in our lives today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, welcome to Turnover. Really uh, happy to have you all here, whether you're online or here in person. And uh, before you sit down, i got a question for you. And the question connects to something we're going to be doing here a little, a little after. Uh, we're going to be doing this uh, uh, after service social at the Gateway Lake Forest. It's got a bunch of restaurants that are down there. And so here's my question. Uh, like, what is your go-to quick on the go food option? Okay, maybe it's a food item or a place. Okay, something that's like, oh yeah, that's what I get every time. Uh, so you got that. Okay, so here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to meet the person next to you and find out how they answered that question. And you can share your answer as well. Okay, ready? Go for it. All right, all right. Yeah, beating some folks. That's good. Thank you for sharing that. That on that uh, that go-to food item or food place. Uh, maybe tonight, if you come to the food court, you'll have a new place. Uh, that's a good possibility. You might want to try something new. Uh, there's lots of different choices down there. You'll hear a little bit more about that in just a sec. But again, just wanted to thank you all uh, for being here at Chernova. And what I would love to do is to walk you through our weekend program. You got that when you came in here. So why don't you go ahead and pull this out and let's go ahead and open it up. And I, th I guess the place that I'd love to start with is what we have on the back is this perforated tariff card called the Connect Card. And love to have you fold this in half like I'm doing, tear this off, grab a pen. There'll be one close by. And just go ahead and fill us out because here's the thing is that we would just really love to hear from everybody, whether it's your first time or second time, you've been here multiple times, uh, the Connect Card is our way of all doing that. And so love to have you uh, take uh, a moment doing that, filling out both sides. Uh, side one, uh, got some uh, boxes and some blanks uh, that you can uh, work on. On the back, there's a big space. So you can write a prayer request, which would be great. We've got a prayer team that will pray for that request. You can write us a check-in item, uh, just to let us know how you're doing. Or if there's a question that you have, any question at all, you write that down. We'll be in touch with you during uh, the week, and we'll try our best to answer that together. And uh, so anyway, it's just great. Every single weekend we do this. You know, last weekend, uh, we invited people to fill out the Connect card and we kind of incentivized it by saying that every uh, Connect card that we get, that we were going to donate uh, $10 towards uh, this uh, relief effort that's going on in the Ukraine with an organization that we're very tight with. And so, uh, so last weekend, we were able to crank out $2,500 of donation uh, to this uh, organization, which is great. And so thank you so much for filling out your connect card. Thanks for being generous. Uh, and so I know that you can just go ahead and just do it, all right? That's probably something that you can do without having that attached to it because uh, you just know that as you do that, every connect card that we, that we get, as we just kind of building um, our relational lives together at Terranova, uh, every person counts here, every connect card counts as well. And so I want to make sure that you get a chance in doing that. Now, uh, if you're here uh, tonight and you're a guest, I want to thank you again so much for coming and uh, perhaps uh, this is your first time or maybe you've been here just a couple of times. You're still kind of trying to, to kind of figure out, okay, so what is this Terranova place all about? And, and I guess the best thing that I would say is that, you know, Terranova really is one of these places where we recognize is that people need next steps and we recognize that none of us really want to live life stuck in neutral, you know, revving the engine. But I think that regardless of where you're at in your spiritual journey is that you're probably looking towards what's the next step for me. And so, so we've got a couple of things that are coming up that I think represent great next steps. One of them is the Terranova Tour is happening next weekend. You've got a flyer in your program that tells you a little bit about it. And I would say that this is a great next step if you have been here at Terranova for not a long period of time, you know, maybe six months or less or maybe a year or less. Uh, it's a great step. Also, if you've never taken the tour, um, it'd be fantastic uh, for you to do 
that because uh, the tour is just really chock full of information and fun goodness. We have lunch together. We go through our values, really the things that are important to us. We talk uh, a little bit about how the church began, which is quite a story. And then we tell you about, you know, things like membership and, and other ways that you can help make Terranova a better place. The tour is a great next step, again, if you're that kind of person. Now, uh, for I think for everybody, it, it, regardless of where we're at, whether we've been here a long time or a short period of time or, or, or whatnot, is that this next step is for everybody, and it deals with Easter. We've got Easter coming up. You can pull out this blue flyer. It tells you a little bit about the things that are going on, but uh, on this one side, we have this Easter team thing, and, and here it is. It, this is a step that all of us can take because, because I think that we all know is that Easter is like the premier weekend of the entire year for us to be able to invite friends and family members, and people are just going to show up, and, and Easter is going to be a deal, man. It's going to be great, and this year is, is going to be great. Uh, and we want to be really at our best uh, to be able to, uh, to open up our doors for our guests. And, and in order for us to do that, it's going it's to take uh, the investment of, of all of us. And, uh, and so here's a step that you can take is to, uh, to begin to fill this out and begin to identify some uh, things that you can do on the Easter team and just kind of roll through them. You'll start off at the top, inviting five friends. That would be huge. The next, praying. That's going to be a huge thing. Praying 20 minutes uh, this week for people who don't know Jesus. Uh, praying through the service. Now, you'll notice that there's an asterisk next to that one, and you'll see with the items that have the asterisks on them, those are all connected to a service time that you want to check. And so heads up on that. Make sure that you uh, got that figured out. Also, we've got this thing Thursday night where we begin to prep um, our, uh, our, our building here. We'd love to have you come and do that. Serving at guest services on one of those four uh, uh, weekend gatherings for Easter would be a great way to take a step. Um, serving as a parking lot greeter. We're gonna, that's a thing. We're going to be doing that, and that'll be super helpful. Serving with Supernova Kids. We want to make it a really good experience for the kids. You can help with that. And then finally, helping with resetting the room because uh, that's also a, a, a big thing uh, because you just want to be able to remove any sort of barrier or obstacle that anyone would have that as they come here, that everything is just primo, man. It's just, you know, clean and efficient. By the way, primo, that's a Hawaiian word. Some of you Hawaiians know that. Um, that's what that is. So this is what I, I believe is the next step for all of us is to fill out this, and then you'll get a chance to hand this in when you leave uh, t uh, tonight. Uh, be fantastic for everybody to get in play because let me tell you, if we all kind of have a piece with Easter, I mean, it's going to be a powerful time, and I am convinced that you'll be glad that you took this step and joined the team. All right. Well, again, just wanted to thank you guys uh, so much for coming. We're in the midst of a series that uh, we think is actually a really great lead-in uh, to Easter, really the perfect way to do that. It's been studying the, uh, the Gospel of Mark, and so let's go ahead and dive into part four of the series that we call You're Not Far. One of the things I think we all uh, love and frankly look for, and it's funny because uh, nobody really had to teach us how to do this, but uh, we all love loopholes. Uh, loopholes, you know what loopholes are? Loopholes are ways around the rules that technically don't really break the rule. It's a way around the rule that technically doesn't break the rule. It's the exception. It's the fine print, you know, the technicalities. And uh, we all learn how to do this, or, or maybe it was just me. I'm thinking it's probably not just me. As kids or as teenagers, it's like, well, mom, you asked me if their parents were going to be home. And I knew that eventually... Their parents would come home because they lived there. You didn't ask me, will their parents be home during the party? I mean, clearly not. I would, I would have known that. It's a technicality, right? Or you asked me to clean my plate. 
And I did, right into the trash can. I just scraped it all right off like that. Or, uh, officer, the sign says no dogs. Uh, and I only have the one dog. Uh. You know, it's like, we love that. We love the little loophole, the workaround, the technicality that gets us off when we want to get off. But at the same time, we hate loopholes when other people are using them technicalities to get off of something and get away with stuff. And when it comes to religious people and religious loopholes, religious people who exploit loopholes in their religion and all religions have loopholes and have ways to work around what they actually believe to be true, uh, we have a word for religious people when religious people do that. What's that word? You know what that word is? Hypocrites, right? Anybody ever use that word? Hypocrites? Hypocrites. And it may surprise you if you've ever used that word or thought that about somebody that we actually get that word from Jesus. Did you know that? That word actually comes from Jesus and Jesus used it in Jesus in the, in the language that uh, these stories are written in the Greek language. The word simply means actor or uh, someone who wears a mask as all actors in Greek theater did or do. And uh, Jesus, fun fact, Jesus may actually have first seen a hypocrite as a preteen in the city of Sepphoris. Sepphoris was just over the hill from his hometown of Nazareth. It was this major, beautiful city, considered the gym of Galilee during his time, uh, just over the hill from where he grew up. Uh, ancient traditions say his mom was actually born in Sepphoris, but this city had been completely destroyed right around the time that Jesus was born. And uh, it was then rebuilt over the next 20 years or so during Jesus's formative years. And since Jesus's family were like craftsmen and artisans and, and uh, stonemasons and carpenters, it's actually quite possible that his family, his uncles and his dad and his brothers and cousins would have worked in Sepphoris much of his childhood and, and teen years. They would, have, they would have had all the work they could handle for years and years and years. And there was this massive, beautiful, very famous Greek theater that was built in Sepphoris as they were rebuilding the city. And it may have been there for the first time, Jesus as maybe a young man saw a hypocrite take to the stage and wear a mask and play a role. And I wonder if Jesus, as a young man, I wonder if he thought, I've seen that before. I've seen people do that. I know what that whole thing is about. I've seen people wear masks and play a role and be fake and be something that's not real. Hypocrites. I've seen that. And, and nothing got Jesus' goat. Like, like hypocrites. And that, that part of that means is like good news for you because if you've ever just really been bothered by hypocrites, good news is you actually may have more in common with Jesus than you think you do. But today we're in part four of a series that we've been saying never should have made it out of the first century. The story, stories that never should have made it out of first century Rome or Nero's Rome. It's a series about the surprising story of Jesus as, as seen through or experienced through the eyes of a famous guy named Simon who's better known as Peter but it's written down, this biography of Jesus we're looking at is written down not actually by Peter, but by another of the first followers of Jesus known in history as John Mark. And John Mark, or Mark for short, was a junior high boy uh, while some of these events were taking place. His family lived in Jerusalem where Mark grew up. They were well-to-do. And as a young adult in his 20s, Mark actually becomes a companion of Paul. You've probably heard of Paul, Barnabas, who was his cousin, and Peter. And he will eventually travel with Peter uh, as, the, as the Jesus movement is taking off in Rome, he will join Peter in Rome to become Peter's translator or interpreter. And then after Nero's infamous and brutal slaughter of Christians in the mid 60s AD, which left two of the pillars of the Jesus movement, Peter and Paul dead, Mark and I just think this is so fascinating, writing in Rome, writing in Rome in the aftermath of this horror takes all of these stories that he's heard for, for a thousand times, that he's heard from his junior high years growing up around this movement and heard and retold with Peter and some of his, maybe his own experiences and he shapes them into the very first full length biography of Jesus that we have come to know as the gospel or the good news according to Mark. 
In other words, Mark reacts to the terrible headlines of his day. And we have terrible headlines in our day. He reacts to the terrible headlines of his day by pinning the very first biography of Jesus because he thinks that's how to respond to something like that. This is what people need to know. And he opens up this biography that he writes, letting us know what it's all about, what Jesus was actually all about, that the time has come, The time has come, everything we've been waiting for is now arriving and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, this kingdom that makes all the wrong things right, this kingdom that changes everything for the better, it's near, it's right here. And so we all must unlearn everything we thought we knew in this upside down world. We must walk away or turn away from the paths that we thought we were on, leave behind our old wineskins, which you talked about last week, and embrace and believe and entirely new reality, which most certainly is good news. Now, previously on You're Not Far, Jesus is traveling through Galilee. His popularity is just exploding. And right then, as Jesus is so popular that he can't even walk into a town because the crowds are just too crazy. Mark very intentionally weaves together a series of stories to illustrate how the value system of this kingdom, this kingdom that Jesus was proclaiming is colliding and clashing with everything we consider normal in upside down world and including religion and especially loophole religion. And again and again, we see Jesus getting angry. It's angry Jesus. This isn't gentle Jesus, meek and mild. This is angry Jesus. He seems to get angry a lot in Mark's biography about him. But unlike me, Jesus doesn't get angry when he doesn't get his own way. Jesus gets angry when religion gets in the way and when religious people leverage God's law and God's word to the detriment of people that God loves, Jesus got his ire up. And so last week on You're Not Far, right in the middle of these scenes where Mark is weaving together to illustrate this collision course of the new and the old, Jesus makes it crystal clear. God did not make you so he would have someone to obey his rules. He made his rules, he made his guidelines for you, for your benefit, because he cares about you. And God actually loves people. God actually loves you more than he loves his rules, more than he loves his commandments. And when values clash and and rules conflict, and in every system of ethics, rules collide and, and values collide, whenever that would happen, Jesus said, it's really simple. Loving people, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving the people around you as you love yourself, that is how you settle the conflict. And then to demonstrate this, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath, like on purpose, in violation to their interpretation of what it looks like to keep the Sabbath holy, what it looks like to have this day that's set apart from common activity. And he does it in a way that just exposes the hypocrisy of the religious leaders there. And Mark wraps up this this series of scenes of this collision course by saying, Jesus has now signed his death certificate. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, immediately went out to plot with Herod's people, the governmental leaders in Galilee and northern Israel, how they might kill Jesus. And so it has begun. But though the story has now taken a dark turn, the Jesus movement, according to Mark, just continues to expand, continues to grow with the last and the least and the, the, the sinners and the sick. And Jesus begins to build this new community. This new, this new wine skin, if you will, to contain new wine, this, this community that he will refer to as family, as family. That's what this community is. But this family, this family he began to pull together, this small group, it was like unlike any small group ever in the history of small groups. And Jesus handpicks uh, from the many who were following him, 12, 12 young guys, 12 young men who would have uh, seriously never associated with each other under any circumstances whatsoever. They were actually enemies. They were enemies of one another from wildly opposing ideologies and political perspectives and social classes. I mean, seriously, like no one was closing their eyes during those first prayer meetings. I mean, they're all just like 
who, what, like, and, and then the strangest thing happens is, as, as this community is, being, is coming together, Jesus's mom, whom you probably heard of before, Mary, and his brothers, who you may not know that much about, brothers like James, who becomes very famous in the Jesus movement, Jude or Judas, becomes very famous in the Jesus movement. His family, his mom and his brothers show up to take Jesus by force and drag him home. And it's like one of these moments in the story, one of many points where we can just be certain. Mark and Peter and the earlier followers of Jesus, they are not making these stories up because nobody would have made up a negative story about Mary or James. James was loved by the time these stories are written down. No one would have made this up. And his family, as Peter, Peter would probably remember, like we, we stepped outside to go, hey, what's up? Like, what do you need? Like, Jesus, like what do we got going on? And his family, his mom and his brother said, he is out of his mind, which is something that maybe you've said about some of your family members. In fact, some of us as parents, we've said that about our kids. We may have said that to our kids. You are out of your mind, right? And here's what they're thinking. He's going to get himself killed. He's going to get himself killed. He, he is on a collision course with powerful people. This, I don't know how he thinks this is going, but we need to rescue him from himself. And, this, and as they're standing outside saying, you bring him out here, we're ready to go. We got like the hood and the, like the rope. And Jesus hears about this and he looks out at this, this community of people like this right here, gathered around him and he says, this is my family. This is my family. This is my brothers and sisters and mother. And so the crowds continue to grow and the community continues to grow and the demands and the needs are just so high. I mean, it's, just, it's crazy. It's crazy. In fact, Peter, I bet Peter looking back on these days, I, I bet he remembered them with such nostalgia and such fondness. It's like what we were a part of I mean, it was just nuts. In fact, Mark adds this line that I'm sure he got directly from Peter. He says, so many people, I mean, it was nuts, man. It was like, there were so many people coming and going. We didn't even have time to sit down and eat. And some of you have felt like that before in your life. Moms, especially, you probably felt like that before. Like we couldn't even catch our breath. And then Jesus says, hey, we need to get away to a quiet place, to a solitary pace, which was a constant rhythm in Jesus's way and in, in, in how he followed his father. And throughout Mark, we see this rhythm of, of high activity and then solitude and refreshment. And so he says, we need to get away. So Peter's like, man, we got in a boat and we headed towards a solitary place, but it was not to be. It was not to be, not that day, not during those days. Crowds apparently heard he was coming. Fast forward to the end of Mark 6. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. And then they ran through that whole region and they just brought people like sick and wounded and dying and hurting wherever they heard he was during, their, during those days. Like there was just no getting away from it. There was no getting away from it. And then Mark adds this, and wherever he went, like villages, towns, countryside, it didn't matter. They placed the sick in marketplaces, which means they would anticipate where he was going and then they would kind of get ahead of his trajectory and they would just bring everyone from that area who was sick or who was hurting and they would post up in the market center where Jesus might pass through just in case Jesus might be able to heal them. And it was crazy, Peter would remember. It was just nuts. But the crowds that were gathering, the faces in the crowds were not just faces of friends and followers and fans. There were some other faces in the crowd as well. And that's where we go today. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come up from Jerusalem, from the big city. Now, Jerusalem is like the temple center of their religion. And big city people don't normally travel to Podunk, Galilee. It's not on their path. And, and, and some of these very important leaders, they're hearing about this rule-challenging rabbi by and it concerns them maybe a little bit or they want to figure out what he's about. And so they make the journey from the big city, not through Samaria. They would never have passed through there. They cross the Jordan and they travel up to find out what Jesus is about. And sure enough, it does not take long. They saw some of his disciples, which was the word that was used for all followers of Jesus, disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. Hands, eating with unwashed hands. Now, it's not what you think. Because parents, some of your parents are like, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Hey, look, kids, 
God says you have to wash your hands before you eat. It's in there. That's not what it's talking about. So Mark assumes that his readers in Rome have no idea what this is really referring to and won't be familiar with the customs. So he connects some of the dots for us. Here's, here's how he explains it. So the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the traditions of the elders. The traditions of the elders. Put a pin in that. And when they come from the marketplace, they don't only eat, uh, unless, uh, eat unless they wash and they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. And for many, I said this last week, for many decades leading up to Jesus stepping on the scenes, the rabbis had been debating and going back and forth the details the details of, of how to actually obey these laws that God gave us, how to obey Torah, what the, which they used to refer to the laws of Moses. How do you do it? It's not just enough to do it, but are we doing it the right way? And in that process, they were adding rules upon rules, qualifications upon qualifications, clarifications upon clarifications, specs, intensifying the law. It's sometimes called intensifying, intensifying it, amplifying it, raising the bar. Well, if this is wrong, then that's probably wrong too. And if you got to that, you probably came too close. So we're going to draw the line out here, intensifying the law. And one of the areas of their greatest concentration or intensification, if you will, uh, uh, the, like the rule says this, but wouldn't it be so much better if we actually went further than that and did this? Wouldn't we be even more righteous if we did more? And one of the greatest areas in which they did this was the area of ritual purity or the definition of what makes a person clean or unclean. And what had happened was the Pharisees had taken all of the, the cleanliness laws from Torah, from, the, from uh, Moses' words that applied really only to priests. These cleanliness laws about processes that priests would go to when they were serving in the temple as a representative of the purity of God, they would go through certain steps and they applied those laws to everyone all the time. It was like, if it's good enough for the priests, it's good enough for everybody. If this is pure for these people, it's even more pure for all of us. It's that kind of thing. And this idea of spiritual uncleanness, of clean versus unclean, over the years, I've always thought, I don't know how to really explain this. And then the last couple of years, we had COVID and we had a massive concern about contamination or catching something or like what, what might happen if invisible things that are real uh, happen to get on you or touch you in some way, especially back in 2020. You remember like washing your hands every five minutes and you touch a doorknob and Whoa, what if somebody else touched that doorknob? What if that doorknob's unclean? I better wash my hands. And people were coming back from the grocery store, like washing their hands and washing their bags and washing their vegetables and washing the box, like washing everything, just in case. I knew people who, went, whenever they came home from anywhere they were, they actually took a shower. It's like, something's out there. Like there are things out there, and there was. There are things out there, and just in case, it's like this just in case thing, just in case I accidentally bumped into COVID, I need to cleanse myself and and that is a great metaphor for understanding how they saw spiritual uncleanness. So their traditions and their elders and their rabbis had outlined specific steps for accidentally touching something that may have been touched by somebody else who was unclean, by somebody else who was contaminated with spiritual impurity. And the potential, of course, is everywhere. It's like out there. It's everywhere you go. Someone unclean may have touched this. And so... Jesus clearly has not adequately trained his disciples. He's not trained his disciples properly about how, how to handle life in an unclean world. How dare he? And similar to COVID protocols, this for them was not just a matter of someone endangering themselves. They were endangering the country. They were endangering God's people. And so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why? Why, why do your disciples not live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating food with defiled hands? Why are you allowing this to happen? Why are you encouraging this unclean and dangerous behavior? And Jesus responds with a charge of his own. Check this out. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, 
hypocrites. And there it is. Now, that's fun to say, you hypocrites. And so I want us all to say it out loud. Only when you say it, I want you to think back to ways that you have found that Christians act like hypocrites. And maybe you've always wanted to say this to a bunch of people in a church. And you've, maybe this is one of the reasons why you, you like avoid Christians or church things like this. And so now is your chance to look around at a bunch of people in church and say these two words. Are you ready? So we're going to say them out loud together. One, two, three. You hypocrites. Some of you had that pent up for a while. Like, can we do that part of the service again? You hypocrites, he says. Isaiah was right about you when he prophesied as it is written. And he now quotes Isaiah 29. Isaiah is speaking to the people of God who are going through religious motions. And Isaiah is like, you are entirely missing the point. And as he quotes this, they all know this. In fact, they not only know this quote, they know what gets said next. And you should read what gets said next. But here's what he says. These people... They honor me with their lips. They have learned to say the right things. They have learned to look the right way. They have learned how to go through the motions. They sound good. They sound so spiritual. They know the lingo. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The outside, it looks marvelous. I mean, they look so well put together. They sound so well put together, but inside, inside in the core of who they are, they are far from me, far from who I created them to be. And consequently, because of that, all of the religious things they do, all of the, all of the, the motions that they go through that they think are for me, their worship, it's actually empty. It's complete vanity. And then here's the kicker. And he says, and 600 years ago, Isaiah was talking about you. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have substituted your traditions for actually following God and what God desires of you. You have substituted rule following religion for true heart transformation. And you've turned religion into a game that only you can play. Nobody else can live up to this. And then you've inflicted upon people that God loves using rules as weapons of shame and alienation. And then he says, and here's the irony. Oh man, in your rigor, to obey all of God's laws, to turn up the volume on obeying God, to intensify Torah, to make people even more righteous. In your rigor, you have actually let go of the real commands of God and are holding on to human traditions that you made up. And then he continues, and you have a fine way, or a better translation would be, you are excellent at, or you excel at. You know what you guys are really masters at? You excel at setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions, traditions that give you loopholes for nullifying and disregarding what God actually wants. And then he gives them an example, ripped right from the headlines of their day-to-day -day lives. It's an example of a tradition that they had that had created a loophole that bypassed what God actually did say. And this, I mean, this is a, this is beautiful, or maybe the better word would be, this is horrible, but it's like this masterful moment. And he says, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. For Moses, as in the religious Torah that God actually did give, Moses said, honor your father and your mother. Honor your father and mother. In fact, it's the fifth command of the Big Ten, like the original Big Ten, like the Ten Commandments. In fact, some Pharisees said that this was the most important commandment. To, uh, they're probably, probably parents. That this is the most important commandment. And in fact, honor always, almost always included this idea of a financial obligation to parents as they grow older. It was their form of social security. This is clear, he says, honor your father and mother. And then, and, and then Jesus from, from Torah adds the punishment for failing to honor your parents for cursing your mother and father. It's execution. I mean, it's hard to imagine a more clear and strongly worded commandment, is it not? But you say, but you say, I mean, it's clear. It's clear. It could not be clearer. And then you create a fog of uncertainty and qualifications and loopholes. And you say, if anyone declares 
what might have been used to help their father and mother and, and their older age, if you declare it or, or state a vow or an oath that it is Corbin that is devoted to God, then you no longer even let them do anything for their father and mother. What? What? Let me explain. Corbin, the word Corbin, the Greek word Corbin simply means dedicated. And Mark is referring to this practice that had evolved in the traditions of the elders and their traditions. And it went like this. A person, kind of like a living trust, a person could dedicate some or all of their assets. So imagine being able to do this uh, to God or the temple after you die which sounds like really devout, doesn't it? Like, I'm just giving it all to the Lord. Uh, I'm gonna devote, or at least this portion, my home or my, my 401k. After I pass, I will devote this to the Lord. Sounds very devout, very spiritual. And then that vow, having made that oath, it then placed any resource that was considered this out of reach of anyone else in the world but you. Now, you can live on it for the rest of your life, but you, that your parents, like helping out your, your, you know, your deadbeat nephew, like a, a next door neighbor who's always needing something, it is now out of the reach. You are not even allowed to use that to help anyone else. And because taking care of of parents was, exp you know, like, it can be expensive. We all know this as our parents are aging. It can be time consuming. This actually became a way, seriously, it became a way of avoiding caring for our aging parents, a way of avoiding honoring them. It's like, gee, gee, mom, gee, dad, I'd love to be hell. I'm so sorry for what you're going through. I mean, tear, it's bad, I know, but I devoted it all to the Lord. It's all his now and mine, but it's his. I mean, like, like, what is that? And this is mind boggling stuff to Jesus. Jesus hated when religious people twisted his father's words to avoid doing his father's will. Jesus hated when religious people twisted his father's words to avoid doing his father's will. Hypocrites, hypocrites. You've created a loophole that allows you to effectively curse your parents and feel righteous while you do it. To actually think you're honoring God while you do it. And before we judge them too harshly, because I know we want to, this is what religion often does. This is, this is where it often goes. This is not unique and this is not isolated. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever avoided something that God had very clearly said. Something that was very clear, and maybe you wouldn't use that language, maybe you're not necessarily a God, Bible, faith person, but something you knew. I mean, it was clear for you in your own conscience, maybe. This is not really good. This is not really helpful. This might be harmful for me or someone else that God loves. Something, have you ever avoided something that was clear to you? fogging it up with reasons and stories and justifications and counterinterpretations. More on that in a second. Jesus continues, and thus you nullify, you render void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and I could go on all day. That is just one example. And you think, you think as you're doing this that, that you're good with God. In fact, you think you're a little better with God, like a little superior with God, and you are not. And God in heaven is saying of you, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then Jesus turns to the crowd. He turns to these people who are listening going, I cannot believe he's saying that to them. He turns to the crowd and he says, hey, listen, listen, everybody, listen, listen up. Everyone understand this, like dial in for just a moment. This is radical. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. I mean, come on, come on, come on. Think about this. Nothing outside of you, all of these cleanliness laws, all of these dietary restrictions to keep a person clean and pure, no external thing can make your heart or yourself, your inner self clean or unclean because none of that actually affects the real you. It's actually, he says, what is, what is already in you that's coming out of you. That's actually what makes you unclean. Typical for Jesus, it's like everything is upside down. Everything's opposite. By the way, that's what Isaiah said. You're turning everything upside down. Everything is opposite. You've gotten it all backwards. Now, this is so radical. This statement right here is such a, di a divergence from everything that they've ever been taught or heard that 
after they leave the crowd and get into a home, and this happens all the time in Mark, there's like something that happens out there and the disciples are like, yeah, yeah. And then they get them alone and they're like, what? what was that? What were you just saying? And so they ask him about it and Jesus answers, I love this. Are you so dull? Which I'm pretty sure he has said about me many times. Like many, many times, more times that I can count. Like John, can't you see? Which is kind of what this word means. Don't you understand? Don't you get it? The kingdom of God is right here. It's, it changes everything the better. It transforms you for the better. Can't you see what's really going on here? Are you so dull? Don't you see, he says, don't, can't, that nothing that enters a person from the outside defiles them for it, it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body, literally into the latrine. So Jesus went there with that part of the metaphor, literally into the latrine. In other words, what comes into you or what you have refused to allow to come into you and what you won't touch, it doesn't change your heart. It doesn't affect your heart for the better or the worse. It doesn't change anything about you as a person. The purity laws, here's what Jesus is getting at. They always pointed to something deeper. They always pointed to a deeper purity, the need for an inside-out transformation of the heart, heart purity, gluten or no, vegan or bacon. That's not going to change your heart. It doesn't change or transform you. In fact, it just goes out of the body. Now, side note here, because this is fun. Mark doesn't miss the significance of this. And writing in Rome, where Jewish followers of Jesus or Jewish background followers of Jesus and non-Jewish background followers of Jesus have begun to come together in communities. This is a radical thing all over the first century world. People who have never interacted before or would never be seen around each other or enter into one another's homes because of all of these laws. Mark says, right here, Jesus has removed the greatest barrier for Jews and non-Jews living together in community. So Jesus goes on. No, Jesus is saying, the problem of impurity isn't dealt with by changing your diet. It isn't dealt with by changing what you touch. It's deeper than that. It's worse than that. And it cuts through the center of all of us. It cuts through our hearts. And so he goes on to say, what comes out of a person, that's what defiles them for for it is from within, get this, out of a person's heart, out of a person's core. And their heart referred in their thinking and their ideas referred to like their mind, their thoughts, their motives, their emotions, their desires, their appetites. It's like from that core of who you are, what comes out of there, like evil thoughts, Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. In other words, he's saying it isn't just as simple. This is like we're going, oh, yeah, because he's like heart is good and outside matter and physical is bad. It's like, no, no, no. It's not as simple as that. This is not about, so just get in touch with your heart. With your, with your good core and your deepest feelings and just be true to that because it will never lead you astray. Jesus is saying, and I wholeheartedly believe, there's actually a problem with our hearts. There's a problem with our hearts and what comes out of us every day is revealing it over and over again. Dark thoughts, lustful thoughts that treat human beings as objects, envious thoughts, that can't be happy for good things that are happening to others because they're not happening to us in the same way. Violent thoughts, angry thoughts, malice, malice, wishing ill will upon someone else. You ever want somebody to get theirs? Like, I just want them to get what's coming to them. Malice, malice, slander, gossip, words and things that we say about others that are harmful, arrogance, hubris, and then just plain folly, like human st stupidity in all of its forms, the inability to play the movie and see the unintended consequences and just brashly go forward once again. And Jesus is like, it's what comes out of it. It's kind of like when you squeeze a tube of toothpaste, what comes out of it is what's in it. Same with you, Jesus is saying, same with me. What comes out of me shows what's really in me. And that can be a really that can be a really difficult pill to swallow. I mean, that can be a really difficult thing to be honest with myself about because I kind of want to say, oh, I don't know where that came from. Innocent little heart of mine. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. 
I know where it came from. That's in you. That's in you. And that's what needs to be transformed. And then Jesus just stops. That was it. Like, interestingly, he shows us this big problem and gives us absolutely no solution yet. But Mark would say, oh, keep reading. Keep reading. I'm just setting the story up. Read on. Don't stop yet because the time has come and the kingdom of God is near and it truly is a kingdom that changes everything for the better, including us, including me and my heart from the inside out. Now, we'll pick it up there next week, but let's talk about us for a minute. Is it possible, because let's, let's be real about this. Is it possible that you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions? Is it ever possible that you might be twisting your heavenly father's words to avoid doing his, his will what he really desires in a moment. Human traditions, human traditions that create like these loopholes and these workarounds that allow us to avoid doing what we know God would want us to do, behaving badly and feeling good about it, like feeling somehow moral about it. Is it possible that you might do that? Now, I know what you're thinking. Like, I'm not really sure what you're getting at, John, because I don't think I would ever do that. I mean, that's just what those guys did. That was horrible. I would never. So let me ask you a few questions. Let me ask you a few questions to draw this out because it probably isn't you, but you might know somebody. So let's, let's see how this works. Uh, first question, do you ever wonder how close you can get to sin without actually sinning? Do you ever wonder like how close or have you ever asked this question, is fill in the blank actually a sin? People have asked me this so many times. Hey, is, John, is this actually, is this actually, I mean, if it's this, but not that, is it still a sin? Because I really want to do that, but I don't want to break a rule. And it's kind of like, how close can I get to the edge without ticking God off? Because I'd really like to still have God on my side, like have God in my back pocket, but I also really want to do this thing. How deceptive can I be without actually lying? How flirtatious can I be with this person at work without actually being unfaithful to my spouse? How how close can I get to the edge? How much can I say about someone without slander or gossip? I mean, if it's a prayer request, is this still okay? Like, where is exactly the line? Have you ever, ever wondered something like this? And while you're thinking about that, a related question, do you ever justify something you know is sin? And I'm putting that in quotes because that's a religious word and that might not actually be a word you use, but how you, have you ever justified something you know is probably not right or maybe straight wrong by fogging it up with uncertainty, because it's clear. It's clear, and then the fog of rationalization and qualifications and pragmatism and relativism, and and that just kind of rolls in, and all of a sudden, it's really not that clear anymore. So, I mean, I know God said this, but, but I know I know what God, I know what Jesus said about loving my enemies. It's clear. It's crystal clear. I know what he said about praying for them and blessing them when they curse me. I know what he said about turning the other cheek. I know what Jesus said about radical generosity. I mean, radical generosity. I know what Jesus said about tithing. Well, tithing, isn't that Old Testament? Isn't that not really for us? I know what he said about radical generosity. I know what Jesus, I know what he said about forgiveness. Jesus made it great black and white. If you don't forgive, of everyone, you are not forgiven. Well, he probably didn't really mean that because he still forgives us. I know what he says about envy. I know what he says about slander. I know what he says about marriage. I know God said that, but I think it's more like just like a general ideal that we kind of aim at in this like ballpark rule of thumb sort of way. It doesn't always apply, but you need to think about, I know, I know that what God said about that area, but my situation is unique. You ever think that way? Like my situation, I know God talked about forgiveness, like straight up, like Jesus talked about that, but what was done to me in my childhood? What was done to me by those people or in those years? (laughs) That's different. That's different. I am perfectly justified in carrying anger and hate and revenge to my grave. I know God said this. Here's one. Here's a famous one. I know, I know that this is clear, but I also believe God wants me to be happy. 
And when various values or rules collide, happiness wins out because that's really what God wants. I know God said this, but he'll forgive me. In other words, have you ever kind of created a little loophole that made it okay for you to do something that was clear and actually feel morally justified while you're doing it? While you're chewing on that one, listen, here's another question for you. Do you believe there is a ritual, something you can do that makes you right with God and removes your responsibility to make things right with someone that you've harmed? Do you believe that there's something you can do, like a prayer of forgiveness, or you can go see a priest, or you can do something that actually makes you right and removes your responsibility to make it right with someone else? Because, hey, I told God I was sorry. So I'm good. Like, I don't have to say it to you. I know I hurt you, but then I went and apologized to God. So you don't, like, I don't owe you anything because I'm okay with God. I don't have to be okay with you. Human tradition, pure human tradition creates a fake loophole around Jesus's clear, clear instruction that if anyone has something against you, you go to them before you even go to God. God's like, I don't even want to hear it. You go straight to them and you make it right. While you're chewing on that one, here's another one for you. Do you ever feel more guilty for missing some religious activity than you do for mistreating a human being? So like religious activity. So like, I know I need to go to mass more. I need to go to church more. Or I haven't been praying enough. I know, I know. Reading my Bible. I used to do this thing in the morning and I haven't really been doing that. I, I said I was going to avoid something for Lent and I've already kind of blown that. And now like, I feel more guilty about missing the mark when it comes to something religious than I do about mistreating my mom, mistreating my sister-in-law, mistreating my coworker, a stranger. I think we most likely mistreat the people who are closest to us, like our spouse or our teenagers or our kids. Or You ever, you ever have that? Pro probably not you. One last one, and then I'll get off. Uh, do you believe that certain moral rules justify you mistreating those who break those rules? There are certain moral rules, certain absolutes. Hey, God says, and the Bible says, and it's clear. Yeah, and there are a lot of other things that are clear too. It's clear. And it seems like each generation has their biggies. Their biggies, like, these are the ones that, that like, we will camp out on, and it changes all the time. Like, every five to ten years, the biggies change, and it's usually made up by people who don't struggle with that particular thing, so that's the biggie right now. Certain rules that actually make it okay or maybe even necessary for you to mistreat, that is, to be unkind or unloving or ungracious towards the people who are breaking that particular rule. And the idea often is, but they need to know. They need to know how God feels about that. And if they feel loved, if they feel kindness, if they feel grace, how will they know while you break other rules that are equally clear, beginning with love your enemies. Now, I'll stop with that. But it's loopholes, right? It's all just loopholes, man-made religious loopholes. And so tragically, you and I can get better and better at religion. Jesus called them experts. You are masters at this. We can get better and better at religion while becoming worse and worse as people. We can become so focused externally, managing appearance, creating loopholes, gaming God, inflicting and, uh, upon others, feeling superior, and in the process, actually pushing people away from God. And you know what Jesus would say? You know what Jesus would say to me and to all of us? He would say, the time has come. The time has come. The kingdom of God is here. It's right here in front of you. That old wine skin had its day, but there is a new day now. It is a kingdom that changes everything for the better, including me, and it is a kingdom without loopholes. It is a kingdom of citizens who live without loopholes, who love without loopholes, don't want no loopholes, don't need no loopholes. I want everything that's upside down in me to be radically confronted and transformed by God's right side up kingdom, and therefore, I need to... Repent and unlearn everything I thought I knew and embrace and believe the good news of a kingdom that makes all wrong things right. And we will pick it up right there next week in part five of You're Not Far. Let me close this in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just pray, it's like starting with myself, that we would all have the ears to hear what we needed to hear, that we would not be dull right now 
that we would hear what we needed to hear, that somehow you would speak to each of us in the ways that we needed to hear you. And I pray that we'd have the grace and the wisdom to bring that into our lives and the courage to start putting steps in front of us to follow you into this kingdom that you say it's right here, it is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And I, for one, just wanna say, sign me up, I say yes to you. And so I pray that for all of us and I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, thanks so much for joining us today. Before you tune out or check out, I just want to remind you uh, about uh, this Connect card. And while I'm talking about it, we've got this tour coming up. Elial mentioned it to you earlier. Uh, a counter to popular belief, it is not a tour of our facility. A lot of people are like, I don't really know that I need to know. whatever. It's not a tour of the facility. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor, like who we are as a community. So uh, it's just next week, it's next week, and I hope you'll come if you've never been. Just write tour me like I just did right there on my Connect card because I'm planning on coming, and you can write that on your Connect card and just throw your Connect card in the basket on the way out. Uh, And then this is fun because this is also an opportunity for us to give, and uh, you can write these uh, or or drop these giving envelopes in the the basket too. Uh, But last week we did this thing where we said, hey, every Connect card, uh, we're just going to donate $10 in your name if you turn that in. Uh, This week we thought we'd take that up a notch, so here's what we're doing, because the scriptures actually do talk about this idea of tithing, and the the word tithe means 10%, and what you may need to know is that we actually practice this as a community. In fact, last year we gave away 30% of our income, uh, and we are always looking like, how are we doing this, not just as individuals, but as a community? So this weekend, uh, we are going to give a tithe, or 10% of our entire weekend offering, to this organization that we're working with in, in the Ukraine. So whether you want to drop an extra five in there or whatever you want to donate, uh, 10% of all of that, we're just going to tie that to this organization we're working with. And I thought you might like to know that. Of course, that applies to giving on on the app, which you can do, or online if you're watching as well. And so... Uh, jump into that. And then, hey, we'll see you all right after this. We're going to head over to the corner. And I think I have, did I have another slide on there or did I never drop it in? Here's what it is. Nope, it's not in there. All right. So right on the corner of Lake Forest and Rockfield on the corner is an open area seating uh, space. And so there's restaurants, these, all these quick to go places everywhere. Just grab something, some Donner G. The taqueria is right where we're eating. So that's quick and easy. There's a great burger place. There's a hot dog place. There's Chinese, a Thai place. I mean, it just, goes on and on. The hat is right across the street. Grab something and join us right on the corner of Lake Forest and Rockville. We're just going to be hanging out and eating together and getting to know each other better. So we'll see you there. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic week and we'll see you back next weekend for part five of our series.